Hello, my name is Marcus, and today I want to show you how we can generate hexagonal tiles into different shapes using the strategy design pattern. I ended up experimenting a lot with callables for this part, and it worked really well. It's got me genuinely excited to share the later parts of this video. This video is a follow-up to my previous one, where I introduced this project. If you want to see those earlier details, there's a link to that video in the description down below. It might give some much needed context. I won't be repeating everything from that video here. I've also included a link to the repository where you can download this project and try it out for yourself. Just keep in mind, it's still very much a work in progress. Okay, now let's get to rewriting this code for different shapes. To change the shape of the map, we need to take a look at how the tiles are even generated in the first place. There are two parts. First, the nested full loop. The outer one handles columns, and the inner loop handles rows. They control the shape. Then we also have this function called tile to world. This handles the offsets, the spacing between the tiles themselves. Let's add some basic functionality to our settings. First, in order for us to select which shape we want, we will use an enum called shape. And I can rewrite the for loop to create a rectangle instead of a hexagon like this. It's actually way simpler, as we just generate a straight line in both directions. The result? Well, not what we hoped. So what is wrong here? We can see that it looks completely skewed. The issue is that every other column should be offset, or staggered. Each other column, if it's even or odd, is offset slightly. So we need to allow for selective staggering where it is needed. To stagger, we need to change the spacing in the tile-to-world function. We'll simply add a conditional here and stagger if necessary. Now our rectangle looks correct. Great progress so far. Now we have both a hexagon and a rectangle shape. But unfortunately, now, we have these big function blocks for each shape, hexagonal and rectangular. They are 99% identical. We just need to change some details. This is starting to bloat our code. I would not want to just add two more of these for diamond and circle. Instead, we need to refactor this into a single function that can change depending on the shape. Currently, there are several functions all related to positioning our tiles. Instead of keeping them here, let me move everything related to that, everything about choosing positions, and just move those to a separate class. And with that done, first, our world generation script is now just 170 lines of code. Later, we might need to refactor out more parts of this into their own classes. But this is a lot leaner already. And if you look here in the generate world function, where before we called the function calculate map positions, now we instantiate a new class called grid mapper, which returns our positions instead. This is our new class. Calculate map positions is only ever called once so it both initiates itself and performs the function. You can see here it receives a copy of the current generation settings and caches them. So this is like a dependency injection, kind of. And the function returns a mapping data. This is a new data class that I needed. Previously, we returned an array of position data. Mapping data is an array of position data and a vector2 for noise. I'll get to explaining why that's important in just a bit. We do a simple match statement here to decide which shape we are going to generate. And just as before, we call these grotesque functions depending on which shape we want. The shape functions return an array of position data. So that's all of the positions that we will later want to place a tile on. And we receive those here. And then we add the minimum and maximum noise, which gives us a complete mapping data. What is this minimum maximum noise stuff, you might ask? I never answered that in the last video. In fact, I think I said it was capping the noise, which is just outright false. We are currently looking at how the positions are generated, but at each position, we are also sampling from a noise texture to get a noise value at that position. These values typically range from 0 to 1, but sometimes the values can be slightly higher or lower. Usually they are somewhere in between. Why does that matter? We are sampling from the noise texture, comparing that to the weights that we have set on our tiles, to determine which tile should be instantiated at which position. We do this by scaling the noise to fit the weights, so that they match each other one to one. In order to scale them correctly, 
we need to know the minimum noise and the maximum noise that was generated during the position step. Otherwise I can't scale it properly. Anyway, I digress. Let's get back to where we were. We have these two functions, one for generating a hexagonal shape and one for rectangular. And I am now going to focus on refactoring these two functions. They are nearly identical. Really the difference is the loops themselves. How do we replace this looping part? It's not a matter of simply extracting some data to another function. We need to change a core part of how this function works. Our previous generate map functions turns from this into this. It looks very familiar because it still does the same things it did previously, but it now receives a loop bounds callable. And if you haven't worked with these before, callables that is, this may get a little confusing. This did take me a little while, I will admit. A callable is simply a function. It's just how we take a function as an argument and pass it to another function. In this case, we receive a function called loop bounds, and this is really nice actually. We have this match statement still, and depending on the shape, we call generate map with a different function that we send as an argument hexagonal bounds or rectangle bounds, depending on the shape. For q, that is column, we are calling the loop bounds function, and it will return a range. And then for each row, r, we do the same thing, but this time with q as a perimeter. And again, q here is column. Hexagonal bounds is probably the more confusing one, so let's start with that. It returns a callable. It returns a function with q set to null. Depending on q, it returns one of these ranges. Okay, so returning a range is really great, but this return function inside of a function looks really confusing. Just as before, the first line here generates the columns and the second line generates the rows. Generate map will call loop bounds only once right here, and it will return that first range that we saw. The function q equals null is an anonymous function. The q is column. For the rectangular shape, it's really totally unimportant and not used. But for the hexagon, we need some way to differentiate between column and row. q is not being set to null here. This is just an optional parameter. It defaults to null if nothing is sent. So the first time around, it defaults to null. In the inner loop, we send q, which is column, that the function needs to create our hexagonal shape, which means that it isn't null. So it does two things. It acts as a boolean to select which part of the branch to use, and it sends the column data that is necessary for the inner loop to function properly. Taking a quick look at the rectangle bounds, it does not use q whatsoever, because both loops are identical. I hope that that's not too confusing. Let me add the rest of the shapes. Okay, I now changed a bunch of more stuff, and I added the final shapes. I increased the buffer here slightly. If you recall, the buffer is the outermost tiles. You'll see in a second. Just to show those buffer tiles more clearly, I am raising them a bit so that they stand out more. Let's generate each shape. Here is our original hexagonal shape, and you see the four buffer tiles here slightly raised. You can see how the villages and characters all spawn towards the center, while the buffer remains empty. Here is the rectangular shape. Looks beautiful. A huge rectangle, but with five buffer tiles. Strange. Diamond shape. It looks a little gnarly. Generating hexagonal tiles diagonally does make for jagged edges. There are some pointy bits sticking out here and there. You will also notice again that the buffer does not match. Here it goes 3 and sometimes 4 and even 2 buffer tiles, so it's uneven. And finally the circle. It has the same issue as the diamond, and there is a discrepancy where the top and the bottom don't look exactly the same. The top has pointed bits sticking out, while the bottom has less tiles than we might expect. So it's not perfect, it's not symmetrical. I'll have to work on that but our shapes are mostly what we would want. The code has changed a bit. Now our calculate map positions, depending on the shape that we select, will call the same function, this generate map. Now we are passing more values to it than just the bounds. First, the stagger is now implicit, defined here. 
By the way, this match statement isn't the best solution. You might want to move these out to a dictionary somewhere. That's probably a nicer solution. But I'm keeping it so it's easy to understand what is happening. Anyway, we call generate map. We pass the bounds to create the shape. The following boolean is the stagger, being true or false. And lastly, we pass a buffer filter. It's not a string, it's just a plain white text. Well, this is also a callable. It's the name of a function. You can imagine here how this could look, with a hundred lines of if-else statements. If hexagonal do this, if rectangle do that, if stagger do this, if stagger do that, etc, etc. This is just such a much cleaner way of doing things. Instead of asking questions, like we would with those if statements, we are sending the answers to this function right away. Each of those callables is an answer. We're just not bothering asking the questions. We are, in a way, breaking away logic in small, bite-sized pieces, turning them into functions and calling only the ones that we need. The first step here is loop bounds. This callable returns a range that defines the boundaries of the shape that we want to generate. Essentially, it determines the size and dimensions of the area we'll be working with. The reason they return an anonymous function and not just a range right away is that the range is not a valid return type. At least it did not work for me, so this is kind of a workaround. It does make it a bit more confusing at first glance. Next we have the shape filter. This is an optional component, meaning we don't always need it. If a shape filter exists, it is called for each position within the loop. The shape filter checks whether a position is inside or outside the shape. If the filter returns false, the position is outside and the position is skipped. We continue. No position is created. If it returns true, the position is valid and we proceed normally. Imagine generating a large rectangle. The shape filter allows us to carve out specific shapes from this rectangle. So the filter skips positions that fall outside of the boundaries or outside of the radius. Once a position passes the shape filter, if it existed, we create position data for it. This step is identical to how we handled it before. Nothing has changed here. The position data includes information like coordinates, tile type, and other relevant properties. Finally, we apply the buffer filter. This works similarly to the shape filter, but it serves a different purpose. It identifies and marks tiles that are part of the buffer, the outer edges of the shape. So previously, determining which tiles were buffer tiles was really easy. I did it with a single line of code. However, now that we have introduced all these different shapes, we need a more flexible approach. Each shape requires a unique way of determining which tiles are part of the buffer. So the buffers are now shape specific. Rectangle bounds, diamond bounds and circular bounds are now all the same. They could actually just be a single bounds function. They could all use rectangle bounds, really, because the shape we get from diamond and circle are being carved out of the rectangle shape using the shape filter. I am keeping this as it is for now. Maybe you want to add or change something here. It does make some sense for them to have their own bounds functions. And there are other shapes that can be created, not just the ones that I've used here. Apart from these callable functions existing in the same script file, this matches the strategy pattern. I think technically, when you read the definition of the strategy pattern, each strategy is encapsulated as its own script. The generate map function in this case is an interface that is always used. When we call it, we select which strategy we want to use. Each shape and filter is a type of strategy. They solve the problem in their own way. The interface doesn't know about the strategies. We don't need any if cases. There's no logic to determine which strategy is best. Instead, we tell the interface which strategy is best suited to solving our problem. And it uses that strategy. It's not exactly a one-to-one, -one of a textbook strategy pattern, but it fits the description. After calling generate map, we get an array of all of our positions. We save the smallest and the biggest noise value that was generated and return just a small class called mapping data with the positions and the noise range. And that's the gist of it.
That's hexagonal map shapes using the strategy pattern. Obviously there is a lot of code here, and a lot of it was shown in the last video. I cannot go over it line by line, and even if I did, you would not want to listen to me speak for that long, I'm sure. Especially now that I'm sick, my voice is super raspy. Download the project, grab a cup of coffee, and take a look at it yourself. Browse the code, rewatch the relevant sections of this video if you get confused. I hope that helps. Before I end this video, I want to quickly mention a few other improvements I've made since the last video. Now of course there are a slew of different minor changes, and a lot of code specifics needed to change to allow for different shapes. But more major changes include Position data now also stores whether a position is part of the buffer, so that information is carried along all the way to the tile. We generate the world in three steps, kind of. First, the positions, which we have talked about today. The result of that step is the position data for each position. Then, when the tiles are being instantiated, some of that data is stored in a class called tile mesh data. When the final tile is initialized, it receives its own class, just called tile. But both the position data and the tile mesh data get tacked on to that tile class, sort of like how you would staple two sheets of paper onto a third, larger sheet of paper. The final tile class now carries all of that combined data. Village density is no longer pre-computed. Villages are placed entirely based on distance settings. The maximum number of villages that can fit the world are always created, unless you toggle villages off. The generation is also simpler and more accurate. I really wanted to change the look of the villages that are placed on the map. It was starting to bother me. Once I thought they looked like mushrooms, I couldn't unsee it, so they got a facelift. Next, I want to remove the settings of the generation into its own script. As long as it's in here, in the same script, it just bloats the code. You can see here how much real estate is covered just by the settings. And we will definitely add more to this, so this is unacceptable. Let's instead create a new generation settings script. Copy paste all of this stuff over into it. Add the generation settings to the world generation instead. Rewrite the code to clean up all of these new errors. Turn the settings into a resource. This allows us to create new different settings for different purposes. This new containerized, containerized, is that a word? This new containerized version comes with the benefits that we can now easily create more of them and save them as presets. Instead of just flat tiles, I made some rougher ones to add some more geometry. It also strikes me that I never showed you how these tiles were made. It's actually super simple. You will probably want to make your own, so here is how I made mine, in just a few simple steps, using Blender. Create a cylinder. Reduce it down to six sides. Remove all but the top face. Recenter the origin to the surface. Rotate 30 degrees to make it flat topped. Apply the rotation. Done. Now if we want, we can add more geometry to it. One way is to inset the face a couple of times, and randomizing the vertices within. Just never move the outermost vertices, as they need to line up with the other tiles. Now we just export this to Godot, export as GLTF or GLB, include only the selected mesh. Let's call it rough hexagon and done. Now we can select the rough hexagon or the flat hexagon, depending on how we want certain tiles to look. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting or helpful. Like I mentioned earlier, check the links in the description to try this code for yourself. It's so easy for me to miss something or just to forget to explain some part. Let me know if that's the case. If you have any issues or suggestions for improvement, please tell me in the comments down below and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one. Thank you, have a great day, and happy coding!